Pizza is the shit. Yeah, don't you know it? Pizza is so punk. It's punk. Ooey gooey cheese. Dripping down to my knees. Pizza is so punk. It's punk. Welcome to the first episode of Pizza Punk. Uh, I am Pizza Jeff, and this is Pizza Paris. Welcome to my show about pizza and punk. I, I toast Thanks. to you, sir. Um, this is the show where we celebrate both pizza and punk. Um, and I, I just think it's one of those things where uh, pizza is a very punk food. We're, we're here to dissect that as well as, as other things. So uh, welcome, Paris. Thank you. Glad to be here. I can jump right into that question because please the, the main aspect uh, that makes pizza, you know, what you're attributing it to, punk, is that pizza is New York City. You know, as a native New Yorker, I've eaten pizza all my life. I probably ate a slice of pizza every day in my life, you know, up until a certain point or many of them. And, you know, it was just, it's just street food. You're walking down the street, you reach in your pocket, you know, back when I was a kid in the Bronx, I mean, I can't even remember how much a slice of pizza was. It was probably 50 cents. You could always get up 50 cents and get a slice of pizza. And uh, even, you know, later on, you know, even now, like in New York, you can get a dollar a slice. So it's, it's a really gratifying, satisfying, wonderful meal to get for a dollar. And uh, if you got $2, you got a real meal. And, you know, being on the street and hanging out in the streets and riding your skateboard around or going to shows and stuff like that, you know, you're always going down the street with the group and you got to get something to eat before you go in and it's going to be a slice of pizza. And I have a perfect Brooklyn slice right here. I mean, that's oh, that beautiful. And, you know, to a large extent, <laughs> uh, the best part about pizza is that, you know, you can really, it's like, it's such a, what's the word? It's such a hearty food in the sense that, you know, oh, the pizza, the pizza is cold. I'll have breakfast, cold breakfast pizza. Or like, it just, it just, it, it reconstitutes really well. You heat it up in a pan if you want. Just, it's just, it's a superfood. <laughs> it is a superfood. I love me some pizza. Pizza is just one of those things where, like, in New York, at least it used to be now, since New York has become a colony for non-New Yorkers, the city has begun to cater to those people. Um, and we have things like Pizza Hut. Like, who the, who, the, who the fuck would put a Pizza Hut in New York City? It's like bringing sand to the beach. But of course, no if you have like thousands of college students and transplants from Iowa and Idaho and Cleveland, they come here and they're used to eating Pizza Hut. So their knee jerk reaction is to go and you know, order Domino's or whatever it is that they eat. I mean, a Domino's in New York is the most bizarre concept in the world. But as a result of, you know, them coming and paying higher rents and displacing New Yorkers, and now there are much less pizza parlors than there used to be because there's all these chain places but you know the the thing that always makes me laugh is when people especially people that are not new yorkers say stuff like oh it's the best slice in new york and they talk about these these, these places down by the brooklyn bridge grimaldi's or whatever it is i don't even know what the name of the place is there's some pizza parlor over there where like tourists stand like five blocks to get a slice of this pizza like what are you fucking stupid go two blocks that way two blocks that way and a block that way, and you can get just as good a slice or better. Because the pizza in New York City is across the board just fantastic. Like this slice I'm getting right now, I never even ate at this pizza parlor before. You know, me and my wife are veganish, so we rarely eat pizza. And so I, I said to my wife, I was like, Where do you think we can get a good slice? And then I thought to myself, God, what a terrible question. I live in Bed Stuy. Just go to any, I mean, there is a pizza parlor right across the street from my house, but they also sell chicken and like waffles and like all kinds of stuff. So it's like, I don't really know if I trust the pizza, but I said to my wife, I was like, is there a guy named Vinny and a guy named Sal working at this other place? And she said, yes. And I said, 
and it's got to be good. And it's a tremendous New York City slice. It's, it's a work of art. It really looks like a work of art through this uh, webcam that I am seeing it on. And um, wow, you said so much. There was so much to unpack with, with that uh, very uh, thoughtful uh, opening remark about pizza in general and pizza. I guess that's where we're, you know, that's kind of like, I guess we'll start there. You know, this idea that also, you know, pizza really got its beginnings in New York. I mean, yes, it comes from Italy, but like when you think of pizza as we think today, you know, it can't, it, you know, it migrated across the great ocean, came to New York, got, you know, solely, you know, nestled in the same way. If you want to think about yourself. it, right. How about this Paris in the same way that fifties rock and roll, whatever, like, you know, early rock and roll, Elvis, little Richard, uh, Jerry Lee Lewis, whatever, all that stuff goes across the pond to England and then all the young little English boys listen to those records and then the English invasion comes back over to us and that rock and roll has been, you know, uh, uh, transformed. And it's sort of like, I feel like pizza, it's like the same way, you know, each pizza parlor, it's like, they're like bands and it's like, you put, to get, put together your, your band, like what is your genre of pizza? What are you doing? You have crazy pizza, pizza shops. You have like bean burrito, crazy pizza, like people that like want like really crazy toppings. Because it's the other thing about pizza, much like say like jazz or whatever, like some sort of improvisational form, pizza itself is also an improvisational food form. And uh, uh, it just lends itself to so many different, beautiful interpretations, the way that you could cover a song in so many wonderful beautiful ways well of course that analogy lends itself to the artist it's like bruce lee said it's not the style it's the artist you know it's not g kundo it's, it's not tiger claw it's not eagle claw it's the it's the it's the, the student that makes it and you know if you're either good at it or you're not i mean talk about one of the most new york movies in the world saturday night fever the opening scene is like john travolta walking down the street eating a slice of pizza it's like if you were like they were trying to paint a picture of a young new yorker and what did they do they had him having a slice of pizza i mean that's exactly the way it, it that was the perfect choice to make but going back to the artist thing it's funny because i i really believe that you could just get in a car and drive across brooklyn and just every pizza parlor you drive past if there's a guy named sal and Vinny behind the counter and you get a slice, it's going to be fantastic. But, and I'm not usually into like what you might call gourmet or trendy kinds of food or restaurants, but I just happen to be friends with my, this guy, Aaron, who owns probably the most popular pizza parlor in Brooklyn. It's called Williamsburg Pizza. Hmm. And uh, Aaron's partner is basically a pizza master and and his pizza is so weird and bizarre like i met him because i used to hang out at this bar in manhattan and, uh, called 151 and this guy would come in at like 4 30 in the morning banging on the door and his entree into the bar was pizza he would have like a stack of like three or four pizza boxes and the, the, the bartender would look and be like, oh, okay, let him in. And he'd come in and he'd put the pizza on his bar. And that was like his, he had bought like an extra hour of hanging out at, after hours. So, and he would just open up this box and, all, and there was like two or three bartenders and, and uh, a bar back and they would start eating. And of course, you know, you're sitting there smelling this pizza and it is, it smells like something you never smelled before. Like it is unbelievable. And, um, um, and so the boxes are sitting there open and the bartenders are, of course, are like, hey, Paris, try a slice. And I'm like, no, 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 because this guy's like giving us looks like like I'm here, like buying my way in, in you know, this is for the bartenders. And they're like, no, Paris, you really got to try this slice. So I try the slice and it's just unbelievable. And I just start and there's like all these different kinds. Williamsburg pizza is really, really, really fucking unbelievable pizza. Um, so there's a there was a place that right guy, across. I'm sorry, but the guy that who's yeah. the pizza master, is old hardcore 
fan. And like, and of course he realized who I was and then we became pals forever. And, uh, and uh, until I found out that he was, anyway, I won't talk about that because it's a podcast, <laughs> but, um, but uh, yeah, food is great. Williamsburg pizza. Check it out. Um, there was a place called the Crocodile Lounge on 14th Street. And know. remember that place? And so what you would they would do, and the pizza was not good. It was it was shitty pizza. Like, you know, it was like, I don't know where they got those pizzas. They got them wholesale somewhere. But what you do is you buy a beer. They give you a little red ticket. They had games in the back. So you play like skee ball or whatever. You get a little right. ticket, and they would th- there was a there was a pizza oven right next to the bar. They throw wow. a pie right in there, these little pies. And so, you know, uh, you could, you know, if you, whether you were drinking or not drinking, like even if you weren't drinking and you just were there with all your friends, like generally that was what I would do. All my friends, they they just wanted to drink. They didn't want the pizza and I didn't want the beer. I just wanted the pizza. So it was amazing. I would just go there and I would just be eating, you know, very mediocre pizza hand over fist. But, you know, pizza's pizza, man. I understand that phenomenon. I actually didn't realize that the crocodile, I never went in the crocodile lounge. There were plenty of bars on the lower east side that I went to, but um, the Charleston in, in Williamsburg uh, used to be a rock and roll bar. God knows what it is now, but um, they had that buy a drink, get a ticket for us for pizza. And they would make yeah. these little pizzas and you wouldn't think they were good, but they were fantastic. And it was the same kind of thing. All these people would go in there, especially like girls, you know, like, I'm like have their purse and they're all very nicely dressed and they want to have a drink and meet boys and they don't want to be messing with no dirty pizza. So they get these tickets and you just end up finding all these tickets on the bar and there'll always be, you know, cause one of those little things isn't enough and they didn't sell them. It was all about getting drink and getting and getting a little pizza, which I love. Charleston's was great. Like I said, I don't know what it is now. Like New York, you know, Brooklyn has changed so much. I need to get another slice. Tell me, um, what I, you know what I like about this format? Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful looking slice right there. Uh, you know what I really like about this format I'm discovering? I like that we can take turns talking while the other one eats. So you could take a bite and then I could talk. And I think that is like the rhythm that you find. So it's like that way we can eat and enjoy pizza at the same time. So I think that's really great. But uh, and, otherwise, and you would, otherwise you wouldn't get a word in edgewise. Yeah, that, yeah. Well, well, <laughs> <laughs> I, I I would I would uh, I would say I could e- equally throw down there uh, I can I can be a motor mouth myself, but um my I'm curious to know uh, you can answer this after you enjoy your 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 delicious mouth bite of pizza I'll make sure there's no dead air um uh, uh, what what are your feelings on that artichoke spot that's that's really gotten very popular There's artichoke pizza in New York City It's like the, uh, the it was also on 14th Street and they had then they put another one in on the other side on the west side of 14th. Uh, and I believe there's one in Brooklyn. And uh, yeah, it's just called Artichoke Pizza. They have three different slices. They do a margarita. Uh, they do the crab slice. And they do a artich- artichoke slice. And that's it. That's all they do. I don't know if you're familiar with that. I don't go for chains. Does Vinny and Sal work there? Well, I'm sure I'm sure one of those guys is named Vinny or Sal with a big, thick push room mustache, you know, uh, but uh, it's kind of like, like a hole, hole in the wall. Because I'm like, I'm, you know, I don't usually eat cheese, I, I, but I, right. you know, as being a New Yorker and being an, an old hardcore kid, I, there's no way to not have a slice once in a blue moon. And now I'm about to eat an entire pie. Well, but, I think that's interesting that you, how you you said you were vegan-ish when it comes to pizza. I think that's pretty cool. And you think about pizza as a staple food, whether you're eating cheese or eating like the nut cheese that they use for vegan style, that like pizza even lends itself to veganism in that sort of way, or at least leaves for depending on how you live your life, you know, a little bit of like, like bendable room there. I think that's very interesting. Well, I'm not a priest, you know, I, right. I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm not a vegan for moral reasons. I mean, I still hunt, you know, that's I interesting. Don't. Oh, <laughs> I was going to say, how does that work? That's interesting. But, uh, it's baby seals with a club, but yeah. oh. I throw them back. But um, yes. th- there's this vegan pizza parlor in, Way- in Greenpoint. How is it? Uh, and I walked in. I think it's called Screamers. And I went there because I heard it was owned by the people who own Champs, which was my, is my basically my favorite restaurant, which I haven't been to in five months, you know, since the pandemic. But um, 
and I don't know that for a fact, but uh, I walked into this place, Screamers, and I walk up to the counter, and there's like four like hipsters behind the bar. Nobody named Sal, and nobody named Vinny. Not even a Giuseppe. So I was very, you know, I was I was a little skeptical, skeptical, but got, but I knew it was a vegan thing. So anyway, I ordered the pizza. I said I'll, I'll take two slices, and Im- immediately they say, "What do you want on it?" Or you know, fifty questions. I said I want two slices. What's the problem? Just give me two slices. Give me a slice. Yeah, it's like, and, and then and she's like, "Well, what do you, you?" So you don't want anything on it? You want cheese slices? I was like, yeah, I want two slices. Just give me two slices, two plain slices. What's, you know, come on. Snap to it. So anyway, and I said, oh, I wanted to go because I had a car waiting outside. So the pizzas come out and she's got these two slices and I could see her. She was just kind of like looking at the two slices and she puts them down at the counter and she grabs this box. (laughs) box, And then she kind of set it on the box and it didn't fit kind of really. And I was like, you just put it in a bag. And she's like, no, the box is fine. And she lays one flat, and then she takes the second slice, and she starts to put it on top of the second biggest, slice. Biggest pizza sin in – that is a pizza sin. You don't do that. And I was like, wait, 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 what are you doing? And she looked, looked at me, and all these hipsters turned around, and they were, like, all very delicate. And, and I said, what are you doing? Are you crazy? And, and, she, and she said, what's the problem? I said, listen, I know you guys are new to pizza, but you don't <laughs> stack pizza – she goes, I'm not new to pizza. I've been working here since it was open. I was like, what, three months? I was like, you're new to pizza. You know, I know you're new to pizza. You were about to stack two slices. You know, let's just put them in a bag. I was like, get a bag, fold the slice in half, fold the slice in half, put it in there, hold, close it up. Go to a pizza parlor with a guy named Sal and Vinny and watch them for five minutes and you'll learn all you need to know about pizza. It's not like a whole lot to learn. You've said Sal and Vinny a bunch of times, and there's one thing that I really wanted to touch on uh, in the realm of pizza, and I also want to shift it over to something that you said to me. Uh, Paris and I first met Paris when I interviewed him for uh, the uh, Misfits documentary that's uh, going to take longer than Guns N' Roses' last album to come out. Someday, somehow, some will, some way it will. Paris said something that I thought was very profound about uh, music and it translates to pizza. But before I even get there, um, I want to talk about Ray's and New York and what that is all about. And like, you know, as a kid, you know, I am not from New York city. I'm a Burbs kid from Westchester, come down on the train, Metro North, come down, come down to the city, whatever, go down to St. Mark's, you know, like uh, uh, go hit up all the spots on St. Mark's. And of course, right on the corner there is Ray's, right? And you go through Manhattan and, you know, Brooklyn, really any borough, I would say, probably on some level, and you're going to find a pizza spot with the name Ray. So I think in addition to the two names you gave, you know, Vinny and Zao, that, that it also uh, Ray is, is one of those names that you can trust when it comes to pizza. Although at the same time, you have to think how many of these Ray's could be impost- imposter rays. I got to tell you, I never, I, I almost would, if the word rays was on top of a pizza parlor, I wouldn't go there. That, that rays pizza on St. Mark's, well, I thought was actually dreadful. I ate mm. there once or twice and their, their sauce was so horrible. Really? Like tomato paste, like out of a can that's or something. That's a station though. That's like such like a place where people, I feel like that's such like an iconic rays. I mean, it was it, it was at a it was at a crossroads, but you know, I never ate there. I never mm. went. And any and one of the few times over the years that I went to a different raise, it was not good. Which is so it's a total anomaly for a pizza parlor. You know, you can go into any almost any pizza parlor in New York, and it's going to be good. But the raise pizza had a their sauce was just nasty. Mm. You know, if I was on St. Mark's, I'd go to Stromboli's or I'd go down to Avenue A at the, eat, eat at the Village Inn on the corner. Or I'd go to Sal's on 7th Street and Avenue A. Oh, I've been to that one. I've been there. And I love the one on West 3rd that was right near Bleaker Bob's. I'm not even sure what it's called. I interviewed Nick Martin from The Stimulators. And we... That's my boy. He's one of the first people I met in the hardcore He's- scene. He's the man. I, let's t- let's talk about that in just a second. But we ordered, we I believe we ordered a pie from uh, that place on Seventh and A. 
uh, Sal's and it was uh, delicious. It was delicious, delicious pie uh, because that, that used to be his neighborhood. I don't know if it still is, but um, uh, yeah, that place is uh, pretty, pretty phenomenal. What you said, you said this about Bruce Lee and I think it, it very much mirrors something that you said to me during our interview uh, many, many years ago when you were talking about how as the Cro-Mags you were taking, I think you said you were taking uh, Motorhead and Bad Brain songs and, or, or ideas like influence, whatever, and trying to write songs like that. And it came out as cro do you remember saying that, or do you, is that something? I, well, I've I've certainly said Motorhead. I love that, okay. but I was making um, a focused effort to try to write songs in the vein of Motorhead, even before I ever heard the Bad Brains. Um, so I probably wouldn't have used the Bad Brains as an, as a direct influence, even though I loved loved them at the time. Um, you know, it's it, what, I, what I was probably talking about is is intent. You know, you can go. You know, artists go into a project, whatever it is. Even if, even if you're just taking a pencil to a paper or sitting down to a piano or anything of that nature, where you're just trying to make something up, and you you can say to yourself, you can sit down and say to yourself, I intend to draw a horse. I'm going to sit down. And I'm going to draw the best horse I can. And you're just drawing and you're sketching stuff out and you're all, oh, this looks pretty good. And all of a sudden, next thing you know, you're, you drew like a really great duck. Doesn't look anything like a horse, but it's a really great duck. And you show it to people like, wow, man, you really know how to draw a duck. And I was like, yeah, but I, when I started out, I was trying to draw a horse. And that's just the nature of the way a band happens. You know, I heard early on that the guys in, you know, the Sex Pistols, they wanted to sound like Bowie hmm. and they sounded like the Sex Pistols. Hmm. And, you know, I wanted to sound like Rush and Motorhead and it sounded like Cro-Mags, you know, so do you say I failed or the Sex Pistols failed or did they just achieve something that they, you know, that they were probably destined to do anyway because they're artists and they were just trying to make something, you know, so you make a duck instead of a horse. So, as long as it's a really good duck, it doesn't matter. You know, it's interesting. I think that I think that translates to filmmaking as well, in the sense that, like, you know, I, I, well, I'll, I'll plug in myself because I really can't speak to other people. I can only speak on my experience. And you know, I feel like, as uh, you know, in my attempts to make films, and my experience being a movie consumer, like a a audience member, I feel like. I feel like that translates in the sense that like, I'm always trying to bridge the gap between what my taste is and what my ability is. And then whatever that is, whatever comes out is, you know, through my, that prism that is me. Mm -hmm. So in the sense of like, in the same sort of way, it's just like, I, I want to be this or I'm striving for this and this is what I can do. And that's not to say that it's, it's anything less or anything more, but just that it just, this is how it comes out of me. And then it ends up being a completely different thing in the same way. Also that the Ramones are kind of doing like, you know, beach boys songs sometimes or, you know, Ronettes or whatever. And then it's the Ramones, same, same sort of situation. So, well, you know, in a band, for example, you have multiple songwriters sometimes. Sometimes you only have one, but sometimes you have multiples. And, you know, what was going on in my brain, what wasn't necessarily the same thing that was going on in Harley's brain. And uh, so it's, it becomes a like a like a like an improvisational tug of war also. You know, you can have this idea of what you wanted to go into making and then both of you end up going in these different directions. And, and in that, I think it's much more like, uh, much more um, spread out when it comes to making a film, because you have lots of powerful voices trying to take a project from inception. Like you have the screenwriter who has the initial idea, you know, God knows what his original idea was. And maybe he thinks he's writing the next uh, Godfather, but he ends up writing, you know, my cousin Vidi. And, uh, and then they, he goes to make the movie and, you know, like, for example, Blade Runner, let's say Blade Runner, 
the guy who originally wanted to make Blade Runner, um, he just want he was an actor, and he wanted to be in something, and he just wasn't getting any roles. So he heard from another actor that like, oh, if you an op if you option a book, and you can get it made, you can make yourself the star of it. So hmm. and some friend of his said, oh, I heard there's this crazy guy up in uh, San Francisco wrote some books, and uh, there's this one great one. You should go ask him to option it. So he went up there and tried to option it and met Philip K. Dick, who was a maniac and a drug addict. And he was probably high on LSD and, and paranoid and crazy. And, you know, if he was if he just happened to have been writing some of his books, he wrote this whole series of books because he thought aliens were speaking to him from outer space and he was writing it all down. And he and this actor had no luck dealing with uh, with him. So he went back home and forgot about it and continued going to castings for a year. And a year later, he told another actor friend of his, oh, yeah, you know, I was going to try that. You knew another actor was going to try to option a book. He's like, yeah, I tried that. I There was this guy up and, and he tells him the whole story. And this guy just goes off. And instead of contacting Philip K. Dick, he contacted Philip K. Dick's lawyer. And he optioned the book for $2,000 with no problem. So now he has the option for the Blade for the movie Blade Runner, and he starts taking it around. He gets producers interested, and initially, you know, a producer to get a a, a, a film made will try to get uh, a director and uh, talent uh, attached, what they call attached. So if you have a script and you can get a name actor attached, then you can get more financing and get a better director and blah 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 and so forth. It's a domino effect. And uh, initially, the actor that they had attached to Blade Runner to play Deckard was Dustin Hoffman. Wow. Now, you can imagine what the film would have been like if Dustin Hoffman was in it. It would have been a completely different movie. But, you know, as time went on and they, they oh, okay, they got Ridley Scott attached. And, you know, by that time, Dustin Hoffman was no longer available or whatever. You know, all the, there are so many uh, variables and, you know, like, what if it had the, the, the movie Pope of Grange Village was originally developed by Francis Ford Coppola, but he wasn't able to do it. So somebody else ended up making it. It's still a great movie. But, like, imagine if Coppola made it or, uh, you know, originally Coppola, uh, you know, he 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 optioned the, the, the story for Apocalypse Now. So he so his friend George Lucas could direct the movie and he promised it to George Lucas. But then George Lucas got busy doing movies because Coppola had produced American Graffiti for him or rescued him on American Graffiti. Right. It was almost a flop. Yeah. And that movie made so much money that he, he was able to finance his Star Wars movie. So he put Apocalypse Now on the back burner and Coppola was in trouble and he needed to make something. And he had this film company called e -Trope. So he made Apocalypse Now and like sent himself, sent himself into that abyss yeah. that was the making of yeah. Apocalypse Now. But if you, do you think if George Lucas had made Apocalypse Now, it would have been anything like Coppola's Apocalypse Now. So, you know, there are so many variables, actors, the power of an actor. If you have somebody like uh, Tom Cruise on a film, he can completely take over the film and steer it in any direction he feels like it because he's Tom Cruise. Or, you right. know, if you have someone like Ridley Scott or, or you know, any number of things, a, a powerful producer, powerful actor screenwriters somebody who wants to change the script you know so whatever the script was in the beginning who knows what it'll be by the end who knows what director will take it in what direction what actor will take it in what direction it's you know, the is such a key thing because they reinvent movies based yeah. on the casting i mean i think the movie I, I forget what it was what i think it was uh beverly hills cop was initially cast with Sylvester Stallone. I'm not really sure of that, but it's something like that. It's one of those films. And then they got Eddie Murphy, and then it became, you know, a different kind of movie. It just if only he had done that just, instead of those people are, actually. you know, these people that are making these movies are trying to make money. It's a business. You know, maybe the people in the center of it are trying to make art, or maybe they went in initially, but they know they deliver uh, the good. And these producers who are making these movies. They want, you know, to put in a couple of million dollars and have a hundred million dollar return. So if they can get Eddie Murphy to to be, you know, and then just mold the whole story to be around Eddie Murphy. I mean, I've seen some ridiculous casting in movies. And then you say to yourself, well, I wonder why that happened. Oh, that guy wasn't the right for the part, but they were probably gearing up for, for production. and Whoever they had didn't work out. 
I mean, I've, I've spoken to screenwriters who were trying to get actors attached. It's like, oh, I got this guy, I got this guy. And I'm like, those guys would be so great. And then a year later, I'm talking to him. He's like, yeah, you know, we have this guy attached. And I'm like, yeah, he's a big star, but he's, I read the script. What are you, are you crazy? He's like, you know, I got to get the movie made. I, you know, I hear that. So to a large extent, I guess it's less about, you know, that personal journey or, uh, or that, that discovery of, of writing a song because it's really it's really you alone until you get together with somebody else and then a singer comes, it becomes, it it becomes compromise so you know it, it, it can either become compromised or it can become you know elevated you know if yeah. you have lane if lane scale is your singer and you write some like little heavy riff and the next thing you know lane is singing on it and you're fucking allison james is awesome or you know or you could you know, you can have somebody not appropriate sing on yourself and it could be feel wasted. And I know that feeling. Wow, I love how you brought that back to okay. music. We went we went on a circle. We went from music. I knew where I was going. <laughs> it went all the way around and then boom, it came right back to music. Yeah, but it's a, you know what, man? It's like chemistry, man. It really is. It's a chemistry process in the same way that you know, you talk about like, I know your history. I don't want to get into the whole history of, of Crow Mags. We, we all know the stories, but just the idea that like, the one thing I would say is just that you and Harley keep, you, you guys kept getting back together because the chemistry and the chemistry allowed you to make great music. And so therefore it's like, you know, you, you, you put aside whatever differences are between you in order to, you know, uh, essentially, you know, be in service to that chemistry. And I guess that's like a, that's, that's a hard thing. It's a, once you find it, once you find that chemistry in the same way that, you know, pizza, you know, has the, the cheese and the sauce have to bake at 500 degrees to marble together as they get ooey and gooey. <laughs> Let me ask you this question. Um, going back to the beginning of, of, of punk and, or, or I should say, uh, the late seventies, you know, punk scene. Uh, and the one thing that I noticed that's very interesting about that is how it's sort of, um, listen, whether you, whether you think the music is good or bad, no matter what, I'm just trying to, I'm thinking about it, like tracing back, like how it sort of splits. And I think it's a very interesting thing. And I've been trying to really make sense of it myself in the sense that you had like this idea of like, like punk, right? Which kind of was really not any one genre. It was really like sort of like, you know, because television was a punk band and the Talking Heads were a punk band and the Ramones were a punk band. All of them sounded very different from one another. And then slowly it just sort of, uh, uh, there, there's like at some point, and I think that time is really like 1980, where it just starts to really split apart. And you have record labels, they're trying to do, they're trying to package it as new wave. Because they, because it's unsellable as punk, because of whatever controversy with guys like Sid Vicious or whatever. Then you have the the hardcore movement that goes another way, right? And then you still have guys like the Ramones who remain virtually unchanged, you know, apart from like you know Joey singing differently than he did on those early albums, going straight forward. And then you have stuff, I guess, even like across the pond, really, you know, you have like this this post punk thing. What, what's your what's your take on all that sort of stuff? What, 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 how do you, when you look back, how do you see those, those branches uh, sort of split? I mean, I'd, I'd be curious if television and Talking Heads and those bands actually called themselves punk rock. <clears throat> I know that the press did, and I know that they go down in history as that, and they were part of, you know, like that genre. But, you know, they, they couldn't be less similar. It's, it's just like the Seattle scene. Like what the hell does Soundgarden and you know and and the Screaming Trees and Nirvana and Alice in Chains have in common? Like nothing. The only thing Soundgarden and Alice in Chains have a lot in common because they're both metal bands, but they're not grunge bands, or and they they bear no similarity to Pearl Jam. So you know when you talk about television and Talking Heads and 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 that that thing of that thing of punk, to me. Again, you know, it's a personal opinion thing. Uh, I certainly wasn't around for the punk scene, but really, to me, to a large extent, the only punk bands there ever were were the Dead Boys and the Sex Pistols. Hmm. I never liked the Ramones. They just sound like a goofy kids band. 
and uh, I never liked the Clash. They were like a radio pop band, and there was nothing wrong with them. I just was I didn't identify with it. When I heard that the growling, I I don't need anyone. Don't need no mom and dad. Don't need no good advice. Don't need no, you know, like when I heard the Dead Boys, that was so raw and so street. I loved it. And the Sex Pistols, you know, the first time I heard the Sex Pistols, I had chills and like changed. Like, oh my God. And then, then I'm supposed to listen to, you know, Blondie and the Talking Heads and have the same feeling. How can I get mm. the same feeling from the Talking Heads that I got from the Sex Pistols? Because they're not the same. They're not similar at all. So to mm. me, what I see is a direct route from the Dead Boys and the Sex Pistols to hardcore and metal. We're all related. There's like, you know, even if like, you know, Iron Maiden is way over here and the Sex Pistols are here and Motorhead is in the middle, there's a degree in between, you know, between Motorhead and the Sex Pistols is cro mags and between, you know, Motorhead and Iron Maiden is you know, Anthrax or something, I don't know. But they're, we're all related, you know, we're all distant cousins, but it's a direct relationship. I mean, those, you know, it's, it's all directly related. But none of us are related to Blondie. None of us are related to the Talking Heads or the yeah. Clash. There's yeah. no connection whatsoever. But wow. there is a direct line from the Sex Pistols and Motorheads right. to Pantera and cro -Mags. So the, the split that, that you're talking about when it happened, I think it happened in, in the beginning. I, huh. think, I think we were just on a different path. That yeah. How they crossed at, at CBGB's or whatever. You know, and somehow, you know, like I said, you know, I, I'm not part of the punk scene. I don't, I don't identify with that word punk. I've said this a thousand times in my neighborhood in the Bronx where I grew up. If someone called you to punk, that was like the worst thing they could call you. Right. You know, like I never, you know, and when I first started hearing about the Sex Pistols, punk rock, I was like, that's the stupidest fucking thing I ever heard. So I never felt any connection to it, even though I loved the music. Once I learned the music, then I was like, oh, yeah, I love this. And then I started understanding you know, that the, all this other stuff was connected to it. I think that's also a big part of the reason why in New York, the hardcore scene was spawned because, you know, we were drawn to bands like the Sex Pistols and we ended up going to clubs to see, you know, bands like the, the Stimulators, Nick Martin's band. And because they were New York's answer to the Sex Pistols, they were basically a Sex Pistols copy band, you know, even though they had original music that was really cool. And their music, again, you know, even though they were trying to be like the Sex Pistols, it went a little further. I think they had a little Motorhead in there and they wrote some songs that played a major, major role in the transition between supposedly punk rock and hardcore. Because they, you know, to a large extent, they were like one of the first hardcore bands, at least the first ones in New York. Even though they called it like a little punk rock scene, there was really no connection, literally, to the scene that was already gone. You know, there was, you know, the Sex Pistols and, and all this stuff that was already starting to be on the radio. We were all on the street and then everybody's starting their own bands. And we're all starting like to get popular. And then all of a sudden it felt like, wait a second, why are we calling ourselves punk rock? That's their thing. That's that thing that on, that's on MTV. Blonde, and I, I keep mentioning Blondie, which I hate to do because Blondie is awesome. Deborah Harry is awesome. I love Deborah Harry. I love, you know, I, I think she's fucking fantastic. And I'm not disparaging her and her music, but her music spearheaded you know, what seemed to me at the time to be the end of the music that I liked. I liked heavy rock and roll music. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden the radio was being dominated by the cars and Blondie and all that kind of stuff because they were pop radio bands and more power to them. And I, and I hate the fact that I bring it up because like one day, you know, because I have mutual friends with Debbie and I'm sure one day she's going to be like, you're that jerk. <laughs> but anyway, I, I'm not, oh, she's not going to watch this, but it's, it's, you never know. She's she's pretty cool. Like actually, she's the last person I spoke to before the pandemic. I went to oh, a concert, yeah. this little bar and down on Avenue A. And I remember me and my wife were like had been talking about whether we were gonna go or not. And you know, whether it was a risk, you know, because to us it wasn't real. And we couldn't believe right. that people were taking it seriously. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. So we, and I said, I was like, oh fuck this. And we waited for the last second. And we were like, oh fuck it. And we went and uh, we walked in this place and there was nobody there. I mean, the place was dead. And I kept thinking to myself, well, maybe it's because of the band. The band was called like, uh, uh, shit, I can't even remember the name now. Butterfly goes to the, 
turnip parade or something. It's the, the guy who stars in the TV show, his name is Michael, stars in the TV show Dexter, and he's a singer. Oh, Michael C. Hall. Michael C. Hall. And, and, they, were, and, they, were, and they were great. He's really good. I mean, huh. it's, very, it's like Depeche Mode, Depeche Mode meets Michael C. Hall. But it's just three guys, and they were really good. And when they played, there was probably 50 people in the audience, not that many people, but one of them was Debbie. And Michael Hall even made a joke on stage. He goes, this is going to be the last concert ever. And we were like, oh. And it turned out that he and the other guys in the band and Debbie, they all got COVID. Get out of here. And when the show was over, me and my wife went to the bar to order like a last drink to have. And we were standing there and Debbie was standing there at the bar ordering a drink. And we just ended up chatting. And uh, and I remember walking out after we ended up talking to her. My wife was like, that was so cool. That was Deborah Herring. And I, and I said, wow, you know, she's pretty brave, you know, because, you know, she's no spring chicken. She's been around for a while. And, you know, she braved it. And then I thought to myself, oh, good for her. And then she ended up getting, yeah. uh, getting COVID. But she obviously, I think she, well, I don't know if obviously, but I've been hurt anything bad. But I think, she, you know, everything's fine with her. Well, I hope she's okay. And I will say this. Uh, you know, it's crazy to think about. I don't know if you've seen this on YouTube, but Blondie covered Hollywood Babylon by the Misfits live. Didn't know that. And they do a really good cover of it. And it's just kind of interesting how, it's just kind of interesting how, like, it took years and years and years, but, like, you know, a lot of, not just not just the Misfits, but a lot of the bands out of, like, you know, hardcore. I think, I think really, well, I, actually, I was about to say, I think the Bad Brains are getting the due that they deserve, but not really in the sense of, like, they got no. the dude they were deserved. They had a multi-million dollar record contract with Madonna's label. They just blew it. I just think it's I just think it's a bummer that they were not they've been they were up in the I know that the Hollywood the I mean the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame is not like everything or whatever. But I just feel like it's kind of like crazy to think that a band like I don't know like Green Day or like uh I don't know just just uh, there are all these bands that are in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And when I think of like what what should puts you in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Well, like, you know, influence and stuff. And the Bad Brains are just an incredibly influential band. And I just, I don't know, I just think I kind of like, I feel like in that way, they never got that sort of due in the sense that maybe they should have. I don't know. That's just me. They may, they may end up in there, you know. I hope so. Band, but, you know, the reality of it is they did have, they had every chance in the world to, to make to, to make it to the next level and they just fucked it up and i won't say they you know obviously because it wasn't the band the band always did what they were supposed to do but hr i know what you're gonna say hr didn't you know it's like they had they had a multi-million dollar deal a two million dollar deal the band took it seriously they they did what they do they wrote and they they concentrated and they did the best they could and then hr comes in at the last minute and sings makes shit up off the top of his head and it's terrible and and that's the end of that. Was that in 2007 with uh, the Beast, uh, Beastie Boy producing, or was that in? Uh, this was uh, in like 90, 90, in the mid 90s. Oh, they, oh. They this was, uh, Voyage. Yeah, this they got was... another chance with the Beastie Boys. I mean, when, right. they, when they have Adam Yauch, who's basically going to let them do whatever they want to because he, you know, was enamored with them and probably let them run amok. I mean, I think I must have listened to that album two maybe i got four songs in before i just it was just so dreadful like if i didn't know who the bad brains were at one point i wouldn't even gotten past the first song i mean i saw i i i went and saw hr live about three or four years ago in some small venue a oh, brooklyn bowl i think and it was mm. if, you know and i took my wife which is complicated because there i am standing there and she's wondering why we're there. Why are we looking? Why are we listening to this dreadful, dreadful, I mean, dreadful thing on stage? And, you know, apparently he has some kind of neurological problems um, that have since been dealt with. Apparently he's had some kind of a treatment that has uh, made him better. At least that's the reports I saw. There's a friend of mine who's close to HR on Facebook and he was always writing about it. But, you know, to me, my, my feeling about it is like, wow, I feel so terrible for Doc and Daryl and Earl, 
you know, because these guys have had, they had the chance and they know that one fucking dude blew it for them. And it's, it's just terrible because when HR was on the top of his game, man, he was unreal. I mean, the guy was on fire, so much fun, so much power, such a great singer. And when if you, you see him now or any time in the past 20 years, you can't even tell that the guy can sing. He's not doing anything that sounds like singing. It's just like some kind of like weird, like like a, I don't, you can't even just, I don't, not even music. It's weird. Which, so, so at the time when I interviewed you all those years ago, I, and this was before, I'll be honest with you, I didn't, was not familiar with the cro in any way, shape, or form. I didn't know, I mean, I've heard the name a million times. I was familiar with Age of Quarrel, that was about it. But I didn't know anything about the, the whatever, the band history and the turmoil and the, you know, the, the feuds and all this. And I'll never forget, <laughs> I'll never forget at the end, we were just chatting in your studio or whatever, and we were talking about bands. And I was just like, oh, I saw, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 John Joseph uh, front, uh, whatever you want to call it, him and Mackie playing with uh, 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 Dr. No and uh, Daryl Jennifer at CBGB's. And I enjoyed it way more than when I saw HR in, tw in 2007, because that was when HR was full on like, you know, just like not just not doing anything. I'll never forget. You just looked at me. <laughs> you didn't say a word. You just were like this. <laughs> like well, that just goes to show how low HR had sunk. Because I mean, HR yeah. is a genuine, legitimate, you know, individual. Right, guy. right, right. And you know, John is just a guy who would like to be like HR. It right. Matter. Well, that's exactly, but that's why I had such a good time because I, as a young whippersnapper, I came to CBGB's expecting the bad brains. I thought HR was playing. And right. that was also at a time where I didn't know who, I didn't know the situation with HR. I didn't know anything. I just, I get up there and I see that it's not for, for black dudes. I see that there's this, 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 you know, guy with his shirt off, he's covered in tattoos. And I'm like, who's this? Had no idea, but he brought the energy that I was expecting to get at a bad brain show. And then I went and I saw HR years later on a boat uh, going around the whatever, and ha that whatever that boat thing. Right. And HR just like, you know, I'm going, okay, now I'm going to see the real deal, the real, real deal. And I get on the boat and HR is just like all just like they're, they're the band is tight. The band is so tight, tight as ever that just thrashing, just absolutely breakneck speed. I mean, talk about chemistry. There are those are some dudes that have such chemistry, and maybe that's why they're like they're you know the hope someday that they'll you know get that 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 last fourth that last quarter back in the right place. I don't know who knows, but there's HR just standing there in the front of of the band who's just thrashing out, exploding so much energy, and HR is just like. Not even, not even say it. they're in the middle of like reignition or something. He's not singing. He's just going like this, and the whole crowd seems so nonchalantly into it. And I'm just going, man, I got to tell you. And at that point, I knew who John Joseph was. So I'm going, wow, you know, I much prefer that to this because at least in that, you know, I'm getting thrashed in the in the pit at CBGBs. You know, I'm having this incredible, you know, experience that frankly was very soon to be extinct. You know, you can't do that. You can't go to CBGB's anymore and get the shit kicked out of you in the pit. It just doesn't happen. It's non-existent. And, um, I mean, I was privileged to have that, even a sliver of that experience. And uh, I don't know. It just, it just, it's just interesting how, you know, how that stuff unravels, you know? I don't know. Yeah. I mean, it, what what do you say about HR? I mean, it, it it's been recently attributed to – like I said, this neurological problem, but you know, he's also been a known had, had a known drug problem for a long, long time. And again, oh, yeah. you can't expect to have lead that kind of lifestyle without it having a lasting effect. And yeah. whether you enjoyed, you know, the bad brains playing with John singing more than uh, when HR was just standing still like a statue, I don't really know how relevant that comparison is. 
because what you saw when John was on stage wasn't the bad brains. I mean, right. You know, from your description, you know, anybody could have been up there jumping around and it would have been better than HR, but it still wouldn't have been the bad brains. Maybe they shouldn't have called themselves the bad brains. That's a, that's a, that's probably the most relevant thing. And, and those guys did try to do that. When the bad what? brains first broke up, they tried, they, they started another band. They called it. Soul brains. No, they called it me and I. Oh. Soul brains isn't a band. Soul brains is the bad brains. Oh. They had a band called me and I, and they tried to do a new thing but they had a terrible singer and they just, they just, and nobody cared. And it was weird because, you know, if they had played the next day as the Bad Brains of CBGBs, it would have been sold out, but they were playing gigs and the hardcore scene just wasn't buying it. They were trying to do like, you know, they were trying to be more mainstream and uh, they played for a while. I went to all their gigs and I literally, I, sometimes I saw them playing for five or six people. It was pitiful. But they just didn't have a good singer. They didn't, I don't know what it was, why they didn't even try to find a good singer. I guess they were still stuck with the Rasta thing. They had some, you know, fake and Jamaican rock, Rasta standing up there being terrible. And But the riffs were cool. I was into it. I went, I would have kept going. But then they went back to the Bad Bridge. You know, you, you go back to something that, that, you know, it's really, really a rare thing to strike a chord with a lot of people and have them respond in such a positive way. So of course they always went back. And especially since people were throwing money, Madonna throwing money at them, Adam, yeah, I'm sure threw money at them, uh, trying to, but the thing is like when you're dealing with mental illness or drug addiction, you, you, you can't, people don't see suddenly say to themselves, Oh, this is great. I should be, yeah. be I should behave, you know, and again, you know, the, the worst, terrible, most tragic thing about it is, like, it, I liken it to the time when uh, the singer of Stone Temple Pilots was arrested for like the fifth time, you know, going and copying dope himself. Like, you're a fucking yeah. rock star, send a fan. But they had, you know, yeah, right. they'd gone through so many things where like, they would put out a record and he would go to jail and then they wouldn't even support the album, so the album's wasted. So they got a couple of hits, but like, you know, writing an album is an astronomical task. And then you put out that album, the whole idea is that you tour for like a year and you, you get everything out of that album to get yourself elevated. And then you do another record and that's how you, your career goes up. So Stone Temple Pilots had this like elevation and then the, the drug arrest and then they put out an album and they, they went down and then they put out another album and then the drug arrest. And, and I remember like they finally got him clean, supposedly. And they made this record and they were just about to release it. And literally like MTV, oh, the new Stone Temple album, Pilots album is out today. And then the next the half, half hour later, uh, Kurt Loder is announcing that, you know, he's been arrested again and he's looking at five years or something crazy like that. And that night I walked out of the music building and went down to my corner deli. And the guys from Stone Temple Pilots were standing in the deli. And they were just wow. standing there like this. Like they, you know, they had probably just heard that Scott Weiland was in prison or in jail and he wasn't getting out. And they were just about to go on tour for a year to support this brand new album that they just put out. So another one of their albums, and I could just see it in their face. And I've been in, you know, I feel to a certain extent, you know, uh, obviously the momentum of the Chromags was dissipated by that same kind of thing. So I really felt sympathetic to them and I feel sympathetic to the bad brains. You know, I feel like it's such a terrible thing. So much power, so much fury, so much great music, so unique and just thrown away. So let me ask you this question. And this is my favorite question. I always love getting people's uh, uh, two cents on this. When does a band stop becoming that band? And so, what I, to just to qualify that a little further, like what is it about a band that makes it a band? Why is it that some bands? And again, I, I forget about the semantics of like, oh no, like that that band doesn't exist anymore or whatever. But just in the sense that like some bands can continue on successfully, cr both critically and whatever financially. Um, despite uh, a, a change of personnel. So is it like, is a front man, is it the front man? Is it a founding member? Is it a singer songwriter? Like what in your opinion, like what formula do you need 
to uh, continue on as that entity. And then once that entity is gone, um, what is the best, what is the best way forward for those musicians to continue um, uh, in, with some sort of legitimacy? I have a hard time answering the question because I can't think of an example. Van Halen, not that's not a good example. ACDC is not a good example. I didn't listen to ACDC after Black, Black Sabbath. Sabbath. I never liked Black Sabbath. Yeah, but whether you like them or not, do you think well, that? I can't, like, I can't respond to whether they were better or, or not better okay. with different things. Yeah, yeah, true, true, true. No, you're right. You're right. I don't dislike them. They just don't right. ring my bell. Like, I hear them, and it's it's like it just doesn't do anything for me. You know, so I really can't think of a band that got I would say better. Ramones, but you don't like the Ramones. I don't never like the Ramones. Actually, to me, that you know, they're not even something that I. It's like they're they are like the Beach Boys to me. Like they just don't matter to me. Um, what about to them? Okay. Um, what about what about Kiss? What about Kiss? There right, is no, so kiss. There is no well, kiss without Ace and Peter. Okay. Okay. All right. I, I listen. Who I'm are not are these a, other guys that are in Kiss. I don't even know their names. Hold so. on, just to, just to say, I am not a Kiss fan personally. I like about five songs. I like Black Diamond and Love Gun and whatever. Um, however, I know that in the same way that you have Misfits uh, nerds, you know, Misfits nerds are the. I always say that Misfits nerds are the Star Wars fans of the punk music world. Mm -hmm. And I would say that Kiss is on that same sort of spectrum in the sense of like the devotion of the fans and the various er that I see through the bleed through. Because again, it's not something that I'm terribly interested in, but what I see from looking over there uh, and going, oh, you know, because people are obsessed with that guy. Uh, who was the guy that replaced um, uh, Ace Freely? Uh, the first nobody the replaced him. Really. Uh, uh, right. <laughs> okay, who was the guy that they hired to, con to continue? Who, the Ankh Man. Who's Ankh Man? Who knows? Who cares? Yeah, no, no. Okay. But my, my point so is I just understand the fanaticism from a Kiss fan and, and a Misfits fan because they very yeah. both of those bands have very much the same thing to offer to fans. They have mm. like. Uh, huge personas, you know. Doyle is Gene, and and you know, and and Glenn is who knows what Glenn is. Glenn's uh, awesome, but he, you know, he's not one of the Kiss. He's definitely not Paul. You know what I mean? It's like they yeah. just have these gigantic personas. Each one of them are so fantastic as individuals. They have such great sing along music. I mean, I right before the pandemic, I saw. The Misfits several times, and I saw a Kiss, and the feeling live is very similar because they have these huge sing-alongs, different kind, you know, like the Misfits have the punk rock sing-along, and Kiss has the anthemic sing-along, but like everybody in the place, everybody in the joint is singing, you know, in bo at both shows, and there's and it's a big stage, and and you can see you can see Jerry from a mile away, and you can see you know Gene from a mile away. These people, they're just bigger than life. Like I saw a tool at Madison Square Garden. It was like there was nobody on stage. These people got nothing. These guys got no nothing. They got no persona. They got no nothing. These guys are just like, you could have pulled five guys off the street off a garbage truck and put them on the stage and they could have had more charisma than these guys. But Kiss and Misfits, they, they're like, they just project off the stage. They have great, happy music. You walk out of the show feeling great, and you can invest your you, you can invest yourself as a fan. You can sit and look at the album covers. You have things to look at. You have things to know and understand, and their names. And you know, it's like such a great thing. This so much fun, you know. So I totally understand that, and I know that there's there's been lining up changes in the Misfits. So I guess maybe that's probably the best example I can think of, but um. I guess, you know. Well, here's the thing about the Misfits that that I think is very interesting that we that we need to note here. I feel like every time, because because the thing is, if you look at them, they, the the Misfits in seven years, because that's really as okay. You you talk about how you know uh, Kiss stopped after you know uh, uh, Peter, Chris, and Ace Freely left, and for me, I'm I am 
77 to 83. I always have been, even in any interaction or digestion of what Jerry did in the 90s, it's always been simply 77 to 83. And the two constants in that band are the two founding members. You have Jerry and you have Glenn, who's the singer, who's both the front man and the singer songwriter. He writes all the music to the band. So, but here's the thing though, when you see Danzig do his misfit songs with Doyle, so so ostensibly, Jer what does Jerry contribute by that logic? Nothing. But yet at the same time, when I go to see Danzig and Doyle do the misfit songs, there's still something missing. And it's not until you add Jerry and you get him doing those power slides and singing those backup vocals to fill in Glenn's voice. He can still sing those misfit songs, but he has Jerry to sort of do like some of the backups and it really just sort of adds. What's wrong with that? No, no. Michael nothing. Anthony to David Lee Roth. No, I mean, nothing. Was great. No, but that's my point. But that's exactly my point is that, is that the, uh, the band, uh, the, even though Glenn fulfills all those things, like he's a founder, he's a singer songwriter, and he was there for all the lineup changes along with Jerry, Jerry, like, Jerry is still needed in order for it to be and feel like the misfits. And, and I guess an extension of Jerry is Doyle, the twins of evil. And so therefore you don't have this. And I got to tell did you see the MSG show? Yeah. It was for me, I've seen him three times as well. And I'll tell you, if I never see it again, if it never comes back, I do, I, it's okay. I'm, oh, I'm okay as a fan because I think, the Misfits playing MSG, sold out, Halloween show, with the same band that they opened for 40 years prior to the year, now opening for them, is just like it doesn't, at MSG, in New York, because I don't consider the Misfits to be a New Jersey band, they're a New York band. That's where they made their bones. They're, 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 they're New York, even if they're from Lodi. They're, they're, they, they're still, it, I love them, but... You know they're not. Well, you're like you're like, like a, somebody. Like I just spoke to somebody the other day, and they were like, "Oh, New York hardcore." You know, all so many fantastic bands came out of there: Agnostic Front, Chromags, Carnivore, uh, Anthrax. And I was like, "Anthrax? What do you mean Anthrax?" They were like, "Well, they're a New York band. They like New York hardcore." I was like, "Well, they can like it, but it doesn't make them a New York band. They're from someplace else. It's like it's just a regional designation. It's not like a snobby thing, you know." Those guys were big shots. But so let me ask you this question. They just weren't our big shots. They were, you know, they did their own thing. But, and so, but, but so let me ask you this question. Do you, did you think, did that feel in, in the way that you personally, who saw them back then, and most likely I'm guessing saw them somewhere in New York City. So does that Irving not, Plaza. I'm sorry. Irving Plaza, Great Gildersleeves. Yeah. There you go. So it's like, it's like, if you're seeing them in New Jersey, does that feel like a hometown show? Or seeing them in, in, in New York, even if it's a big place like Madison Square Garden, does that not feel more like a hometown show by those regards? Well, of course it felt like a hometown show because it's my hometown. Yeah. And also the Misfits were part of our scene, but they're still not a New York band. They're incredible. And I wish they were born in the Bronx, but they weren't. So... They get all the props and the respect, but they ain't a New York band. Well, yes. either way, <laughs> either look, either way, that to me, that MSG show was That's the right. But I saw the Jersey show. show, and I tell you, I saw that show, one too. I was the there too. Show was great too. The best one I thought was the, the LA show. I missed. I heard great things about the LA shows. I will say this about: I thought the New Jersey show was okay. Out of the three that I saw, it was the it was probably the weakest out of the three that I saw. But it was also his mother died that day, and he went on and performed like crazy to think about that. That wow. he that that he is you know they're about to play the Prudential Center sold out. Mother passes away, and he's got to go out and do that show, and it's just like there was a lot of money involved. I, well, yeah, of course. It just but it's like could you? I just I mean firing on on whatever cylinders you need to fire on in order to do your thing. I just, man, like what a, what a, uh, must have been some sort of undertaking, but I saw them at Riot Fest, the second show. And I, you know, I, I went out there cause I was like, I, I used to, I have roots in Chicago, so I had a place to stay, but I was like, 
who knows if this is going to implode after Denver? Like that was the first place that they played. Like this is gonna, this could implode in two seconds. Like what? I, I better go catch this while I can, because at any moment, you know, Jer, uh, Glenn and Jerry are liable to, you know, have their hands around each other's throats, and that'll be the end of it. And so I made it my business to, to get out there, <laughs> see them play. You know, I mean, I, I, you know, me and my wife flew out to L.A. to see the show, and it was one of those. It's just another one of those things, and I, I'm very much. Uh, um, proponent of saying you got to go see everything when you can i mean yeah when chris cornell was alive i was always telling my wife oh we got to get tickets to this we got she's like Did, we just saw him do we have to go again and mm -hmm. i was like, i mean I, I hate to put it in such a dismal context but yeah you know chris is a drug addict he's been a lifelong drug addict and uh he could die any day and uh, so, you know, I know it's a terrible way to think about it. I wish him well, but, you know, so we went to everything. We we saw the Temple of the Dog show at the Garden, which was goddamn spectacular. We saw him do an acoustic thing at Carnegie Hall, saw Soundgarden a couple of nights. Or, I mean, just every time they play. So when the Misfits, not the no the Misfits or drug addicts or anything, but like, yeah, it's the, the thing with the Misfits was so weird, too, was, you know, Back when we used to go see them in New York, they were not a big band. I mean, they were right. you know they were big for a New York band, but they weren't like a huge band. They, they were playing places like Irving Plaza. Said they were big for their New York band. I just want to point that out. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. Go, ahead. go ahead. Go ahead. But, Keep you know, they, it wasn't like yeah. they were huge or anything. Yeah. And, and it's such a rare. I mean, I can't think of another example where a band goes away for thirty years and when they come back, they're headlining Madison Square Garden. It's mind boggling. So, but so I wanted, I really wanted to go see one of these big venue shows just to see what it was like. Yeah. And, you know, like, a, you know, I've seen the Misfits, the real Misfits in a little club in New York City many years ago. And I didn't really, I didn't like them back then. Again, you know, they weren't what I was looking for. They were more along, if anything, they, they were kind of like a, you know, they weren't part of the transition into hardcore. They were like almost like, you know, that that line we talked about with the Sex Pistols and stuff. They were like still way. They were still almost on the same level as the Dead Boys and the Sex Pistols as far as punk rock goes. At least that's the way it, it, it felt to me at the time. And then yeah, they were all. But they kind of came up. Then, I though. thought they were doing Kiss's act. You know, yeah. when I when I saw them on stage wearing makeup and and being up on stage like. I, I just it just rubbed me the wrong way. I was already a Kiss fan, and I thought I was discovering something new, something vibrant. You know, when I saw the Stimulators and Kraut and the Bad Brains and the Mad, yeah. all these bands, Dead Kennedys doing Circle Jerks doing all this, something that was totally different. And I felt like the Misfits were just kind of like a throwback. I just, I didn't get it at the time. So I was standing in the back, and they're playing, and I'm like begrudgingly like tapping my foot, like God damn it, stop! Well, this one's pretty good too. Oh fuck! You know, those, like that kind of thing. Songs, so, man. But but the, the effect that they had on the audience at Irving Plaza and Great Gildersleeves when I saw them was 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 amazing because everybody was singing along every song, doing every whoa and every you know hey Brito, and like it's it's a fantastic thing. But then you see seventeen thousand people do that, it was fucking unreal. That show well, at the at, at the L.A. Forum was yeah. un fucking real, and the L.A. the L.A. fans. They were not too cool for school. They were throwing down, singing every that. line, which surprised me because the New Jersey show, they were not singing the way they were in L.A. The L.A. show and the Garden show were fully committed. Amazing. And that's a phenomenon you're never going to see. When are we going to see another little club band that comes back 35 years later and headlines Madison Square Garden? It's unbelievable. It's, it's unprecedented. And, you know, the interesting thing, and this is from all the interviews that I've done, you know, I've never interviewed those guys, but I've interviewed a lot of people like you who've seen the band and whatever. And, and in all the, 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 the musings that I hear, you know, uh, the one thing that, that makes that really, really sort of solidifies why, like, why that or what was so attractive and magnetic about them live is just the fact that the, you have these choruses where like the word is whoa, no, or go. It's like a stoplight, red, yellow, green, like, you know, go, <laughs> whoa, no. And, and anybody who's never seen the band before, whether, you know, back then in the eight, in the eighties, late eighties to, to now getting dragged along to a show, not knowing what they're getting into 
the moment that they hear that those songs and feel the same infectious groove that you felt in the back, standing there with your arms like this, um, they can instantaneously sing along and go, go, or whoa. Well, my wife was singing along. She never heard The Misfits before. Now she loves The Misfits just from those, from those shows. Yeah. Well, there you go. So, you know, I don't know. It's I, I just think it's like uh, it just adds. I think it adds so much to. And I got to tell you, I, you know, I was in the pit for Madison Square Garden. And it's like you turn to someone who you don't know at all. You, you turn to them. You look at each other face to face. You've never seen each other. Maybe you would hate each other's guts if you had a conversation in real life. But in that moment, you're both locked eyes. You can't believe what you're seeing. And you're both screaming these lyrics that you've been screaming since you were however years old into each other's faces, you know, arm arms around each other, just like reveling in the fact that you can't believe this is really happening. And like, you know, like a great example, Astro Zombies, the, to hear everybody in unison, Glenn's got that, <laughs> Glenn doesn't even have to sing, he's got that mic out and everybody's just going, oh, oh, you know, and it's just like uh, it, 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 it electrifies your blood, like your blood, like electricity flows through. I'm getting like, like hype just talking about it. If, if I couldn't, if I didn't sound like uh, if I didn't, if, if you couldn't I tell. I may not look like it, but I, I totally understand. I know that yeah. feeling. I stood in that pit many times. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Had that experience, that, that bonding and, you know, at carnivore shows with, that's how I met Evan Seinfeld from Biohazard bonding at oh, a wow show over over the greatness of carnivore and i met you know so many people at, at hardcore shows before you move on i, I have an okay. astro zombie story oh i know what this is going to be go ahead i i've seen the, go, go ahead i don't want to spoil it go ahead you tell me so i'm sitting in the rainbow having dinner with my wife and i look up and there's jerry like in full regalia <laughs> and, and i see him and he's kind of like I, mean, I was actually waiting online to get my table at, in the doorway and like i turn around there he is in full regalia and he looks at me, he goes, Paris, he goes, you have your guitar with you? And I said, <laughs> yeah, it's in my hotel. He goes, good. What song do you want to play? <laughs> what? He goes, we're playing tomorrow night at the Roxy and uh, come up and stage and do a song with us. What song do you want to do? I said, Skulls. He goes, Astro Zombies and walked away. <laughs> like, really fast. No, he goes, this is what he said. He goes, Navarro's so doing hilarious. Skulls. You do Astro Zombies. And I walked and he walked away and I was like, oh shit. So like, so I went back to my hotel room and reminded myself how to play Astro Zombies. And I showed up the next night and uh, I was walking up the line. There's a line of like all the Misfits fans waiting online to get in. And, and Jerry's standing out there shaking hands and kissing, <laughs> kissing babies as he does yeah. so well. Uh, I love the fact that he is so, you know, 100% with everybody. But uh, he's out there and I walk by with my guitar case and he's like, Paris, he goes, did you, did you, did you know how to play Astro Zombies? And I go, yeah. He goes, all right, show me. And I was like, what? He goes, he goes, let's let's rehearse it right now. So there's like 150 people waiting online to get it, and I put on That's my so guitar, cool. and I start strumming, you know, acoustically, and he starts singing, and we we just asked for zombies right there on the sidewalk, and as Beautiful. soon as I was done, he was like, okay, okay, you got it, we can do it. Like, but he had to make sure. Yeah, and, and you came out there and you did now, it. The funny part is. Yeah, I go out on stage, you know, and I practice the song to the record, you know, the tempo yeah. that they played on the record. Uh, and uh, these guys were playing so fucking fast. And uh, me and my wife have been sitting there I'm drinking. They didn't tell me when they were going to introduce me. So I didn't get introduced until they were on, had been on stage for a while. So I probably had three beers, which isn't a lot, but it was enough. And I go up on stage and you know, all the, you know, AC Slade, super nice guy. I think he came over and he was like, oh, you know, plug in here. This is my amp, blah, blah, blah. You know, Jerry's introducing me and I, I'm smiling. I'm, you know, saying hello to Jerry. And all of a sudden, Jerry's like, one, two, three. And, and we start playing. They start blasting through this song so fucking fast. I have no idea where they are. And I'm like, I, I literally cannot. And it's so loud and so noisy. Yeah. And Jerry's face was felt out. I could, not, I could not catch up. So I did what any good professional musician would do is I turned off the volume on guitar, my guitar and just pretended to play. And I figured at some point I would be able to hear it and catch up. 
notes, but I really couldn't. So wow. I just stood up there with them and played my guitar without the volume on uh, through the song Astro Zombies. And it was over in about 26 seconds. And That's Jerry was like, festival. ladies and gentlemen in Paris, thank you. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> and then ACK, he was like, that was great. That was great. And everybody, I walked up stage. Oh, that was so, so great. great. And I was like, you're like, Little does anybody know I was I was doing a Vinny Stigma. I was like not plugged in. But that's, wow, that's my that that's is, my Astro Zombie story. That is a great that is a great story. And yeah, Jerry is a very gregarious guy to you know his fans and stuff. And so about hey, what's going on? <laughs> just like grab grab a hold of everybody and like you know take a picture and just yeah. Jerry is awesome. Um, let me ask you this. Okay, so I am not a I'm not very familiar with Peter Steele or his his bands and stuff. Uh, I've listened to a little bit of typo negative. If you were to recommend to me an album to begin with when it comes to typo at negative, what would that album be? The carnivore album retaliation. Okay. Because, I mean I I like typo negative. Yeah. Um but I love Carnivore. The, the second Carnivore album, Retaliation, is just the, the best thing he ever made. And he never did anything as uh, original. original. Now, that doesn't mean that the Typo Negative stuff isn't great. The first Typo Negative album, Slow, Deep, and Hard, is fantastic. It was a big flop, but it was, it was fantastic. It has a lot of really unique musical ideas on it. It's, to a certain extent, it's a Carnivore extension. The, the song, I Know You're Fucking Someone Else, is probably the best carnivore song, but um, it was before he kind of got into the whole goth thing and 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 had success with that. I think I think that one of the detrimental things to create to Pete's creative growth was success, because the sec you know he put out the you know I, I was talking about this just the other day. He put out Retaliation, you know the first carnivore album he put out flop. Who put out Retaliation? It's a flop. He starts doing typo negative, puts out the first typo negative, it's a flop. And then he puts out Bloody Kisses doing the God thing, and he has success. Not just success, but like huge success. Like what year was that? Stuff. Which album is that? What's that? Well, what year is Bloody Kisses? I don't know. 1990, maybe? In the 90s. Okay. Yeah, sorry. So he puts out this album, and it has huge success, like platinum success. And um, the effect of that success was that he stopped changing. He stopped taking in influences. He stopped molding himself because he, you know what it was? It was like a life of trying to, to play something that people liked. And, and he, and when he finally did it, he was like, okay, this is my thing. And he just stuck with it. And, you know, that's great for him. He had success with it, but from somebody, from somebody watching the progression, it was the end, hmm. the line, not the beginning. It was the beginning of his success, but it was the end of his, creative growth uh so if, if i was going to recommend to anybody especially somebody who likes metal and uh to, everybody should own carnivore's retaliation album it's just it's a staple it's okay. one of the best albums ever made it's 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 a journey it's like it's a it's a bunch of stories and great musical depth it's fantastic let me ask you this question i'm, I'm about to just totally shift gears on you back to kiss for a second are you, uh, um, how do you feel about the Detroit Rock City movie? Do you like it? I didn't see it. You didn't see it. What was the reason for not seeing it or just, just so like a, just a non-factor for you in every way, shape and form? I mean, I don't remember when it came out. I think I was in my twenties. It just seemed like. Detroit Rock City came out in 1998. That was the movie with, um, oh, directed so by Adam I mean, yeah. I'm a well, grown man. I just seemed like a teenager movie. Gotcha. Gotcha. Uh, all right. Listen, we're, we're, it, we're wasn't about it was about going to a kid's show or something like that. Right. It was about going to, yeah, it was, a, it was like a road trip movie about going to a kiss show. And at the very end, obviously kiss plays. It was my, that was my introduction to kiss. As I said, I'm not a kiss fan really at all, but I, that movie is one of my favorite movies. I love that movie. And for me, that was, like that's how I heard Love Gun and was like, wow, I really like the song Love Gun because it's the intro to this movie, which is a great song. Great song. I think it's, and, it's, yeah. it's the best song. I 
I think if I had to say what, like a single kiss song that I personally really like that, if, you know, hands down, it would probably be just love gun. Although I finally, you know, i I went down a YouTube rabbit hole one day and I discovered the band in 1975 doing black diamond. What a great song. And, well, I, they were, yes. What a great song. But here's the thing. I'm, wa I'm, wa I'm watching this YouTube video. I'm listening to this song for the first time uh, as a full grown man. Like I said, I did not grow up with kiss. This is my, I'm just being exposed to kiss, you know, whatever, just, just, just taking it in. And um, I started to realize the song was really good, not by the music per se, not to say that the music was bad, but it was when I started to see the synchronized movements to the music, because back in 75, they used to do this thing where, uh, you know what I'm going to say, where Ace would get down on his knees and the two of them would just do this motion. And that's when I'm, I'm, I'm watching this I'm going, oh, this is fucking awesome. And, you know, uh, and it's funny. I know whatever, again, like with all the, the kiss drama that like, you know, there's this whole thing about like, you know, you, you know, Peter Chris being like, you know, a heart, a big, big part of that band. And you listen to him sing the lyrics, you know, the lyric to, to uh, black diamond, you know, no matter how much Paul Stanley, you know, tries to diminish Peter Chris's role in the original version of that band that song, that, 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 that lyric, that lead, you know, the, the, all, the whole thing, the, the, the whole kit and caboodle, it's pretty powerful. It's pretty great. But for me, um, my part of what made, what, what I find enjoyable about kiss was really like sort of experiencing that movie and then sort of understanding what it must've been like to enjoy that band at that time. And that's what made it sort of interesting and fun for me as a person outside of that time. So, um, I, saw, I saw Kiss in '77. My father just dropped me off. And how was that? It was unbelievable. It yeah, was unbelievable. General admission. So we got there early when the doors opened. Ran to the stage, put my arms on the stage, and stayed there fighting my, for my position until Kiss. Yeah. And I was right below Ace, and it was uh, unbelievable. Gene Simmons flew and blew fire and. Yeah, I was say they did the whole stage show, right? With the, the they were young and yeah. it was fantastic. Wow, that's unbelievable. Listen, we're we're gonna land this airplane, but let's land it with uh, let's land it in a, a sort of a, a, a sweeping uh, corkscrew motion as we're coming closer to the ground of the of LaGuardia Airport. <laughs> that made no sense, but it did to me. Um, let's talk. Let's talk about. Um, tell me about meeting. Nick Martin and tell me about, you know, seeing the simulators and tell me about how you, you tried out for the mad, right? Tell me about the mad. Tell me about, uh, did you think screaming mad George was a genius? And what was that like to see that whole, whole trip on stage? And, um, uh, yeah. Well, I meet myself and a, and a friend named Paul Dordal started venturing out at night you know, as young teenagers, 14, just skateboarding around. But Paul was, he was 15. And Paul was like a little bit more mature than your average 15 year old. And he ended up hang discovering the clubs and stuff that he could get in. And he started inviting me down. And we would see bands like The Mad and they were, you know, very much guar before guar, but not funny. They were guar, but like dead serious. Uh, the crazy masks and projections and yeah what kind of stuff were they doing if you could be a little bit more descriptive like like there was this one mask that was like this crazy hand mask that george would wear on his head the singer was this guy it wasn't like that it was like this oh okay it was, and uh screaming mad george was the singer he was this japanese guy who had like half white half black hair like a like a chocolate vanilla cookie and um and he was just a weird dude and and uh, they were we, they had we, they performed abortions on stage and they were just crazy, and uh, George did all the artwork. He did all their flyers and album cover art, and he did projected animations and there were paintings on. It, it was just craziness. And um, I'd seen them a couple of times. They were like the big popular band, you know. They were part of that, you know, dying punk scene, or you know, maybe it was alive in New York. It, to me, it, Again, I always just think of it as the Sex Pistols and Ramones and Talking Heads and all those people that were gone. And there was kind of this thing happened in New York. And The Mad was basically the biggest of them. 
And uh, so one day I'm at school and I overhear this kid say that the, that he auditioned for the mad to play bass. And he got in, he was in the mad. And I, and I was standing there like, like stunned and shocked. Like, I, I remember thinking to myself, you can get in, like you could be a normal person and you could be in this, one of these bands, like the mad that plays all the time. I just I couldn't even believe my ears. And he, and he was like this Japanese kid. I forget what his name was. But anyway, I didn't know him that well. He was like an architecture major uh, at art and design. And from that night on for like two weeks, I went out every night to Max's Kansas City, to Tier 3, to every, you know, every club that was out there looking for Screaming Mad George. And uh, they were in, there were no ads for the Mad playing, oddly enough. And But then after, after about a week and a half, I saw an ad for Butch Lust and the Hypocrites, which was another pretty popular band at that time, um, featuring guest bass player screaming mad george oh so i was oh, like oh, so i went down and uh i saw george after the show standing around with some people and i just walked up to him you understand i was like 14. i was like teeny with had long hair and uh i just walked up to him i was like hey i, I heard you're looking for a bass player and he looks down at me and like butch lust was standing there and a bunch of people and he goes no not anymore i already i already found somebody i said yeah yeah kid from my school but i'm better than that kid <laughs> and he goes uh okay i said you just gotta hear me play so he goes okay so me and him walked over to his apartment he lives in soho somewhere in one of those like movie movie lofts like you know you watch these yeah. old movies from the 70s where somebody gets in a freight elevator and empty opens up into some massive apartment that's where he lived and you know i i always say this but like i, I don't, don't know whether it was a figment of my imagination or if i i've embellished it but I, I seem to remember that he had paintings hung in the elevator shaft so like really? when you went up in the freight elevator you could see these awesome paintings no like <sighs> it's definitely a memory and and they were like crazy bizarre abstract super cool fucking art like huge canvases and just like wow. creepy things bats and like fucking freak and george with his crazy hair and he's japanese and weird and punk rock and we go into his apartment and there's paintings all over the walls there's half done sculptures and all the props from the mad shows and yeah and was, you know me I, I was an artist i was going to the high school of art and design and i wanted to be a musician this was like a fantasy world this guy where this guy lived this amazing loft just surrounded by art like this is the life that everybody would want to live and and we we walk over and he's got a couple of amps set up and he's got a bass and a guitar and uh, he hands me the bass and he picks up the guitar and he says uh let's let's play a little bit let's see you know what yeah. you got and we 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 noodled around a little bit and uh he showed me a couple of mad songs played me a tape we played along with it and we played for like a long time maybe two hours and that also goes to show you how different it was in new york i mean it must have been you know four o'clock in the morning when we were playing wow. out in his apartment da, 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 just jamming it out and he was showing me drawings and paintings it was just like so fascinating like it, this guy this was like the coolest person i had ever met in my life yeah, even Matt George, man, he was so fucking cool, like fourteen year old kid in high school. And so after we jammed, he goes, "Yeah, you know, you're right. You're better. Would you like to be in the band?" And I go, "I would, yeah, love to." And he goes, "But he goes, I want to tell you also, it's not the Mad anymore. We're gonna call it Irrational." He goes, "What? It's much bigger. It's gonna be a much bigger stage show, but it's the same core members of the Mad." Uh, but I'm going to call it. And I remember thinking to myself, are you crazy? The Mad is the fucking greatest band name ever. Yeah. For some reason, he wanted to change it to the Irrational, which is funny because he was Japanese and you couldn't even say Irrational. He was like, Irrational. You know, so was this like, like 1981 or 82 or what? It was, it was probably 1979 or 80. Okay. Okay. Because it was pre-Chromags. Yeah. And uh, so we started jamming. And, you know, I show up to the studio and like there's the guitar player who looked like Jesus Christ, you know, the crown of thorns and the robe and stuff. He was there playing guitar. So I was playing bass and they had some drummer and George. 
And, you know, I had been given a cassette tape of the songs. It was like eight or nine songs. And George had showed me, and I was going to George's apartment and he was showing me how to play. So, but we got to the point where it was time to rehearse. And we went and we just started rehearsing for a gig that we had coming up like a month away. So we're jamming and jamming and jamming. After like two weeks or so, when I feel like I have the songs down, well, I'm facing this kid, I'm facing weeks. this kid in school every day that I stole the gig from. <laughs> and, uh, and so one day we go in, and now that I know that I know all the songs, I had just written the song, the, the song that ended up being Chromex song, World Peace. Later on, I had just written that song, and I wanted to show it to George. So we go into the studio. And we're all standing around. I was like, hey, George, check out this, this song I wrote now. And all of a sudden, like, George like, walks over to me and he just like grabs the, the neck of the bass with his hand to stop me from playing. Uh, I'm like, hey, man, what are you doing? He just looks at me and goes, he goes, I write the songs. I said, yeah, no, you've written all the songs, but like, I wrote this song. You want to hear it? And he goes, I write the song for, for this band. You, nobody else writes songs for this band. Uh, and, I at him and I said, but you don't even want to hear it to see if you like it. And he goes, he goes, he, he was, he's like, Hey kid, you know how many times I got to tell you, I write the songs. And I was like, well, okay. And I took off my bass and I yeah. put it in the case and he looked at me and he was like, what are you doing? I said, I'm leaving. He goes, what do you mean you're leaving? I said, I can't be in a band that I can't write songs. This is what I said. That's what I do. Wow. And he, and, and he goes, but I fired somebody else to make room for you. I was like, well, he's still there. I'm sure he'll come and do it, but I'm not doing it. And I said goodbye. And I was like, I'm going to go. Oh. And, and like from that moment on, that was like my mission. I was like, now I'm going to go and start a band yeah. playing my songs. Wow. And that's exactly what I did. And so, but I was still going around and seeing shows. And I had heard about, and that segues into the next thing, they're yeah. pretty timely, which is uh, going to see the stimulators, you know, because uh, this is uh, I was recommended by some folks at school who had lent me the Sex Pistols album. Oh, if you like the Sex Pistols, you should go see the Stimulators. So I went to go see the Stimulators, and uh, they were playing at Maxis, Kansas City also. Uh, um, so maybe this did happen before, because I had already been in Maxis, Kansas City. So the mad thing might have happened after I saw the Stimulators. They played a lot together, too, right? Yeah, I... I don't recall Semi. seeing them often together, but they did play together sometimes. Yeah. But that that but when I went to go see Butch Lust and the Hypocrites um, at Max's Kansas City, I, I, I the first time I saw the Stimulators must have been before that. But it still relates um, because that first time I went to Max's Kansas City to see the Stimulators, uh, I didn't want to go in. Because mm. it's like I walked up to Max's Kansas City and there were like motorcycles parked in front of the, it was like a Hell's Angels hangout. Like downstairs yeah. was all Hell's Angels. It was two floors. Downstairs mm -hmm. was like a restaurant. It was all yeah. Hell's Angels. And upstairs was the club part. But, you know, I didn't know that all you had to do was go over to the side and walk up a staircase. Yeah, you didn't staircase. have to deal with that. Yeah. But I thought it was, I, you know, I didn't know. So there was like a mailbox like halfway down the block. So I was just kind of sitting on this mailbox observing for a while. <laughs> looking at the punk rockers and you know i knew i wanted to go in but you know i just you know i, ne I had never been to one of those kinds of shows but so i didn't know what i was in for <clears throat> and then like in the crowd i could see this girl and she was talking to a bunch of these punk rockers and it was a girl from my high school that i that i didn't really know but i you know i always saw her around she was really cute <laughs> so you remember the cute girl and i saw her and she saw me and she walked over and she just walked over and she just kind of like puts her hand on her hip and she looks up, up at me sitting on the mailbox. She goes, I know you, you go to art and design. And I was like, yes, I do. She goes, what are you doing? I said, um, I was thinking about going to see this show, the stimulators. She goes, you should, you want to come and hang out with my friends? I'll introduce you to Nick from the stimulators. And I was like, okay. So I jumped off the mailbox and this, her name was Gabby and me and Gabby like walk over to Nick. Wait a minute. Gat, wait, 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 wait. Is this the same? I think I know who this Gabby person is. You, you wow. probably do. Okay. Sorry. Go ahead. I, I didn't mean to interrupt your story. I just, that just had a, okay. yeah, go ahead. 
continue. Because you know the hard that, that punk rock that scene, what it was, it definitely wasn't called hardcore at this point. It was it was the scene they called it. Uh, was really small, and, and to yeah. a large extent, it was mostly girls. It was like a whole bunch of girls that were huh. into it, and there was this kind of like the, these few central bands, the Mad, the Stimulators, and anyway. So Gabby walks up and she's like, she's like, this kid goes to my high school. His name is Paris. This is Nick or whatever. And Nick's like immediately friendly. He's like, hey man, how you doing? Shakes my hand, and he's. He's got all kinds of badges and stuff on his jacket. He's got this leather jacket that fast says rules. loud, fast yeah. rules. And I thought that was so fucking cool. And he was all he also had like makeup. And like not like makeup, <laughs> like you know, it was like a it was like a slash, like a wink <laughs> on a his eye like this. And I'm like, oh my god, like 14 years old, and there's like all these weird people with makeup and and the the like. But anyway, he, I thought he looked fucking cool and he was wearing a kilt. Yeah, he built a leather jacket. He had this like wing, and he he was looked like a punk rocker. And I was like, uh, I like the Sex Pistols, so this is I think what I want. So and he was super friendly, and uh, and he and he took off one of these badges, and it said Stims, huh. like short for Stimulators. Yeah. And he gave it to me, and I was like, Wow, yeah. thank you so much! And I put it right on, and uh, he and and uh, and it became like a regular thing where like I would meet. I, I, that night, I met Denise, uh, the guitar player, and uh, and Patrick. Harley wasn't very friendly at that time. Uh, it wasn't that he was unfriendly. He would just I just didn't cross his path um, mm -hmm. that night. But I ended up hanging out with Gabby. I was hung out at, all that night with Nick, and it became like a thing. Like I would show up to shows, and I was so small that uh, Denise would say, "Oh, uh, hide in the bass drum case," and they would like sneak me into the club in a bass drum case. Like shit like that. It was just super fun. But Nick was the first person that I met on the scene and he was totally 100% friendly. Like when I was having that experience of not knowing whether this was like right. the kind of thing I wanted to, to go to because I didn't know because I was 14 and I was just a kid. And, uh, but he made, he 100% welcomed me. And, uh, and I also grew to love the stimulators and love his bass playing. And at that point was basically when I had formed a, 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 my band plan. My band plan was like there are all these bands playing the New York scene, and they're all pretty good, but you know they're not great. Like Kraut, I liked Kraut; they were good. I liked uh, the Stimulators; they were good. And I, I had seen the Bad Brains that night. The Stimulators played was the first time I saw the Bad Brains. Then I, that yeah, that I didn't get the Bad Brains at first. Uh, it took me a couple of times to see the Bad Brains to get it, because they just weren't what I was looking for. I was looking for that, you know, that Sex Pistols thing and. The stimulators were delivering that. So, but as a result of seeing the stimulators so many times, I saw the bad brains, and of course, by the time that all caught up to me, uh, I absolutely loved it. But uh, my plan was I, I could poach, you know, like this is just like you know a kid plan. My plan would be to go and take all these people from all these different bands and put them together in one band, yeah. and you have one great band. And it <laughs> sounds like you know a crazy plan for a kid, a little kid to have, but you know. That's what little kids think about. You know, we make plans and we have aspirations. And my aspiration yeah. was to, yeah. to to cherry pick the scene and make the best band I could. Now, uh, the, the for me, the benefit was very soon after that was uh, Harley quit the Chromags. I mean, uh, he quit the Stimulators, and he was just out on the street looking for stuff to do. And I ran into him, and I ended up we ended up starting a band together. Now, when you have him first, when you're looking to poach other people, it's good to start with somebody that everybody knows. So right. from that point on, literally my plan to poach people happened because then we poached Mackie from Frontline. Frontline Mackie was playing in this band called Frontline, and I knew him from skateboarding and the skateboard ramps on the west side. So yeah. I went to him and I said, listen, me and this guy, he was in the stimulators. Stimulators were popular. You know, we could be popular right away, that kind of thing. And so I enlisted yeah. Mackie. And then the next thing, you know, well, Eric Casanova really wasn't an enlistment. But after that, we enlisted John, who had been in Blood Clot. And then we ended up enlisting Doug from Kraut. You know, so we, you know, yeah, well. getting, getting Doug from Kraut and getting Mackie from Frontline was, and getting Harley was pretty 
in line yeah. with my plan and pretty amazing. It put together a, a powerful band. In my, my little youthful plan to start a band, Nick was my first like per choice. Like I thought Nick would be, Nick would play bass and you know, you know, he was my central focus on that whole thing. Like when I looked at the stimulators, um, to me, he was the one who encom en encapsulated the, 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 the talent that should be poached. Mm. It wasn't Harley. Mm. Oddly enough, I, I always think that that's kind of interesting because I didn't, I didn't particularly think Harley was very good drummer in the simulators uh, because when Harley quit the simulators, they replaced him with another guy who was way better. Oh. But the simulators popularity disappeared like the minute Harley quit. And he, wow. to a certain, he played a role in it to a certain extent because he was kind of like a little celebrity in, in our teeny little scene. And right. he made sure that all the kids like thought that the stimulators were no longer cool because he wasn't in them anymore. But they, gotcha. I continued to go see them for quite a while. I think they played for, you know, it's hard to judge time from back then, but it seemed like maybe for another year, I saw quite a few gigs with this other drummer and they were great, but there was just and nobody. They, that and they had a whole, you know, it's funny. I know they released, they released a live like album from CBGBs or something like, with, like a, a whole slew of songs. They put out the one single loud, fast rules and run, run, run. But they had a whole slew of, of songs, and it's just like it, I, I was always surprised that they never recorded an album or that that never materialized. Do you know the reason why that? There was no infrastructure. There were no there were no bands getting signed. It wasn't yeah. until later, you know, uh, the, to a large extent, the reason why the stimulators aren't a part of the lore, you know, of the hardcore <laughs> of the hardcore history, is because they didn't make an album. If they had made a proper album. I think they would be in there with, uh, you know, or maybe they would have continued. Who knows? But songs like Machine. Yeah, Machine. That's a what great I was... Yeah. Well, they're on, they're, they are on the Thrash. They're on the Thrash uh, compilation, the New York Thrash compilation. And here's my, so here's my other question, too. All right. I know about the A7 spot, right? That was like another big spot. That's where the Bad Brains recorded their, their first album or something. Why would it, you, you think they were, why wouldn't they just no, record there? They didn't record it once at, at A7. They recorded it 171A. Which oh, was down the oh, oh. A7 oh. was on Avenue yeah. A and 7th Street. It was a little, right. uh, the wall. Uh, now. Yeah. And 171 was uh, a bunch of blocks up, maybe four okay. up uh, above Rat Cage Records. And okay. It like It was kind of like a recording studio slash venue, and they recorded there. Gotcha, gotcha. Did not, did not. Thank you for clarifying that. Was not, was not. Uh, did not I mean, understand. Who, who could know? You know, yeah. if you weren't one of like twenty girls and eight guys. You wouldn't know. Yeah, it's amazing. That's really, really amazing. Um, by the way, you know what I was thinking of? The thing that I was thinking of when you were telling the story about uh, screaming Mad George and uh, you know wanting to you know uh, show him the song that you had written. Um, it, it was the same story with Bobby Steele and Glenn Danzig. Bobby Steele had a song called When the Evening Comes and brought it to Glenn Danzig because he wanted to do it as a Misfit song. And Glenn was just like, no, I'm, I write the songs. That's not, And, of course, he did it with the Undead. I don't know if you're familiar with the song. I like that song. It's probably my favorite Undead song. Uh, but it kind of captures my imagination as to what it would look like as a uh, Misfit song. And also... You mentioned this earlier about his, uh, whatever, like his sculpture mask thing that he had. So have you seen the movie Society? Are you familiar like with Society? Thing. Like that. No, okay. Really tucked in. Okay. So he kind of has it. So in, you know, he, as you know, he went on to do lots of special effects and stuff, you know. Like Aaron Street. Yeah. So he did a movie called Society for Brian Usna and that one of the one of the big pieces in that movie, maybe 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 I had been many years since I've seen it. I haven't seen it in, a, in quite a while. Maybe it is like this and not like this. But there's a there's a guy with a head, and his head is is like something either like this or like maybe like this. I don't know. 
but I wonder if that that maybe that came from uh, that that DNA comes from his band the Mad. I don't know. Of course it does. It sounds like he just took that mask and yeah, that's what I was thinking when you were saying that. Um, I man, that's one of the I, of all the bands to come back. I know he did a version of the Mad in Japan in two uh, thousand ten. I, I, man, that's something I wish I could have seen or seen the reformation of or something. I think that's just a, I don't know, it's just a shame. I, I really like those those two singles or three singles or whatever it is that uh, that he did. Paris, thank you so much for uh, appearing on the very first episode of Pizza Punk um, and uh, wishing you a uh, 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 I don't know what I'm wishing you actually. Like, I just hope that this, all this craziness ends and we can all get back to whatever it is that we were doing before. That's all I want to say. Fingers crossed. We'll see what happens. We can all be looking back at this and being like, holy shit, we actually thought it was going to go back to normal. I, I truly don't know. Like, what, what is going to happen? Like, what's going to happen to live music? Like, well, are we fucked? At the moment, it doesn't exist. I mean, it's crazy. It's just like I said, you know, the story I told earlier about going out that last night before the pandemic and going to see the puppet parade, uh, Michael C. Hall, um, butterfly, yeah. uh, which was awesome. But, um, you know, even that night I thought we were being silly for even like hesitating to go to that show. If, yeah. if you told me that night that I would be locked up in my house for the next six months and it has, you know, I mean, it literally has been, I've been, I mean, maybe I, I, obviously people are not as careful as I am because I actually rode my bike, um, across town the other day and I rode through Williamsburg and there were people sitting in restaurants and bars, standing outside of bars without masks and hugging and touching and doing all kinds of stuff. And, and, and then I went through park slope and it was crowded and there were all the restaurants and everybody and all the stuff you see on, on Facebook and stuff of people having parties and going on the beach and acting like nothing's, nothing's going on. And, you know, I understand what it is to be young and to feel like, fuck it, I gotta have fun. But like, yeah. don't they, love, don't they love their parents? Don't they love their grandparents? You know, those are the people who are dying. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, it's just crazy. And then, you know, me and my wife actually, we had our wedding anniversary about two weeks ago. Mazel tov. We Thank you. We wanted to do something. So we knew that there was a restaurant over by our friend's house that had like an outdoor seating thing and it's super spread out. And we went over there and we sat at the table that was on the end. It must have been 10 feet from the other tables. And the waiter had a mask and the whole thing. And, and we were wearing masks and just sitting. It was just it was it was so Mad Max and so crazy. And mm. it, it just seems to me it. Every, every time I w when I was in that situation, I kept thinking to myself, teleport myself a year from now if things just yeah. get worse or stay bad. And like all of us are losing our homes because we can't pay our mortgages and Ugh. and how many more people die. And, you know, New York City reverts to, you know, you know, escape from New York and crime just goes berserk because, you know, the minute you turn off, you know, the Internet and. TV That's and I'm saying. people Why don't have not? a place to live. People are going to start killing each other for everything. I was, saying, I was saying that the internet. I was when like a month in. I was going. You know, it's going to save us. You know, the internet and Facebook and the ability to connect and socialize. And blah blah blah. That's what's going to get us through this. And I was literally saying that very thing. The moment you shut that off and people can't like communicate or like have any sense of what's going on, they're just going to go into full on panic mode and it's just going to be survival you know, yeah. yeah, survival mode. And I'll tell you my, so I had a similar experience for me. I have, a, I have an Alamo up here, Yonkers and Yonkers is an Alamo draft house. That's my spot. I, I love that place. And I have a subscription there and great I go, chain. I'm sorry. It's a great chain. Yeah. I really like it a lot. And I have the uh, season pass subscription. So I pay $20 a month. I can go see a movie. Every, and I'd much rather watch a movie in a theater if I could than I could than at home. And I have a really great wife that lets me go. So I, same exact situation as you guys. I, uh, it was March 12th, maybe, or March 11th. And I, it was kind of like a risk. It was slightly risky because everybody's like, everything's starting to shut down, but Alamo Draft House is still open. And they just sent us an email about how they're sterilizing everything top to bottom. This is before anybody understands that 
uh, whatchamacallit, uh, anybody has any idea that like it's all in the air or whatever. And uh, I did wear a mask. I did go and I wore a mask, but it's like, then I like would want to like eat snacks. And it was like, I'm, I'm, you know, constantly futzing with the mask so I can, you know, uh, 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 put food in my face. And it's like, and, and who would have thought that was the last time I went to go see the hunt, uh, that, that Blumhouse movie. I went to go see the hunt. And I was like, I was like, man, I, I, in the back of my mind, I'm going, man, I'm going to go now because I don't know when I'm going to go to the movies again. But I thought maybe that, that was two months. I wasn't thinking that it, I would still that this things would still. I thought we were gonna. I thought we were gonna be done after three weeks. I thought everybody's gonna hunker down. Everything's gonna be okay. And now think about all the things that are shutting down in the interim. And then if things do go back to normal, like think about everything that's on, all the things that have folded, all the venues, all the movie theaters, all the independent chains. It's just it's crazy, man. I mean, it sucks for the people that own them, but you know, to a large extent, the infrastructure will still be there. Somebody else will just step in and take yeah. over the services. That's and, why and I, bars and clubs I, yeah. always came and went. You know, it's like I, I I understand to a certain extent, but like I've watched bars come and go a thousand right. times of the year, venues come and go. It, it, what's what's more terrible is the thirty five thousand pe dead people in New York. You know, yeah, I, yes, I, I yeah. hear everybody not, worrying not to understand, it. not to understate that in any way, shape, or form. Absolutely right. I, the, I know the, you're not, but the, I think yeah. a lot of people are focusing on these these businesses. Convenient. And, uh, yeah, yeah. You know, again, not to be insensitive, but you know, I'm an old New Yorker, and to a large extent, I hope a lot of these businesses that came into the city afterwards, like the, the yeah, more chain. Like if Seven Eleven doesn't come back, I'll be very oh, happy. Yeah. Of all, you know, all these chain restaurants and things like that don't come back. And if NY, if people don't want to go to NYU anymore and the dorms empty out, that's all right by me. Um, well, twenty percent of that. And if tourism dies in New York City, that's all right by me. You know, I, I, I when when I when I started having to wait online at restaurants that I've been <laughs> going to my whole fucking life. Yeah. Uh, in the village, like Veselka on Second Avenue. I went there on a Saturday afternoon and they were like, you know, it'll be an hour wait, an hour to eat a Veselka. Okay. You know? And that's be just because that neighborhood is overrun with colonists and NYU students. And so if those, yeah. if those kinds of things, you know, if people are afraid to live here and, and all that kind of stuff, I don't really have a problem with that. I think the, the herd being thinned in New York city, not in terms of death, but in terms of uh, occupancy yeah, is only for the better. Well, because, 20 you, know, you know, everybody, everybody hails the fact that New York is a lot safer. And so do I, because I'm a married man now and I have a home and I want the place to be as safe as possible for my, for my wife. But to a large extent, it's not been made safer for me. It's been as a New Yorker, it's been made safer for the tourists and the, and the people to move here to, to make the real estate more valuable. Um, so I'd rather have this, you know, cleaner, nicer place restored to, New Yorkers, huh. because st just statistically alone, there are twice as many people in the city now than there were when I was in high school. I mean, that's insane. That is there are insane. twice as many residents in New York City than when I was in high school. Yeah, but it's even, I mean, this is, it is what you're saying, what you're hoping is already starting to happen. It is balancing out supposedly 20% of Manhattanites have left or something like that, or maybe it's all five boroughs. I don't know. But I mean, if that's, I don't know, I don't go anywhere. I haven't seen it, but uh, yeah, that can't be a bad thing. Maybe it'll lead to a new musical sort of situation where everything empties out and the whole, the whole, whatever, the whole uh, environment is just right for whatever fostering of some sort of, you know, counterculture uh, scene to take place. Like that's, wasn't that what happened kind of in the seventies a little bit in the sense of like, you know, the Lower East Side. You, and you, you can open up a store front business anywhere. You could have a, a, a one night venue. You, you could do all kinds of, you can open a record store. That's yeah. 1A, which we mentioned earlier was just, you know, a shack of a building that somebody took over and made it. Yeah. And A7, the same thing. It was just a little storefront place that didn't even have windows, and they put the names of the bands on a piece of loose-leaf paper and stick it in the window. DIY you know, commerce. Kind of thing. But, yeah. you know, 
when when you have a, a culture of bottle service where no one will open up a business unless they can have booths where people give their credit card at the front door. Like I'm, I'm going to, they, you go to clubs and literally, you know, it used to be, oh, you look cool, you look cool, you look like you'll make our bar look cool. You know, like we'll have a cool scene. Now the guy stands out in front and he goes, you, what credit card do you have? Literally. And and they'll say, you know, they'll, they'll say, okay, give me your ID and your credit card at the door. The doorman does this and he goes, okay, how much are you willing to spend? I've heard this. And the guy's like 3000 and he goes, okay, you get a table. And so they take this group in and they give him a table and he's committed to $3,000. That's how you get a table in the club. And the minute that happened, my city was gone. You know, there's I'm never going to be, I've never, never going to be, you're never going to go to a place where, you know, Pete Steele and Jimmy Gestapo and, and uh, Vinny Stigma are all sitting at the same bar because they can't, they don't have the credit card. That's just so crazy to me, man. I've ne I've never been in, I've never been to clubs like that. Period. Like in general, so I don't really have any reference. But uh, that's yeah. Well, but it's not I, just clubs like that. All the clubs became that. Even the strip clubs. Yeah. The strip clubs have bottle service now. Like you used to just walk crazy. in down at you walk in and you'd go over to uh, you know to a table and sit down. Now it's like oh no, that's bottle service table. That means you got to give a credit card and pay two thousand dollars just to sit down. And, and, and in so many places, you know, there, there, there wouldn't like there would never be a place in Manhattan like the Anceteria was where, the, where yeah. it was a dance club where Madonna hung out. But the cro played there and there'll never be a peppermint lounge like, you know, that has a stage and a huge dance floor. And everybody goes there to see Susie and the Banshees one night and Black Flag the next night uh, because they can't have black flag on a night that they're going to have bottle service. And that's how they make their money. Did just wow. all the venues in Manhattan change to being completely commercial, uh, you know, mercenary venues. I mean, uh, they, there's just, there, there's, there's no, first of all, there are no live. I mean, besides Irving Plaza, there's no live venues in Manhattan that I even know about, you know, they're all gone. I guess, I guess, yeah. I guess, uh, um, Jesse Mallon has a couple on uh, uh, Third Street or Bowery or whatever. Oh, He's yeah, Bowery right. Electric, and um, yeah, they're all right. That's yeah, that's true. Yeah, I take that back. But that, that's, no, that's, that's, that's it. That's, but that's, that's literally it. it. That's nothing. That's nothing. They're not even proper venues. Like that Bowery Electric place is not a proper venue. It's and not Webster like a proper Hall, venue that CBGB's was doesn't even have a good sound system. Right. It's Webster like Hall was basement thing. I mean, thank God he does it. It's cool that yes. he does. He's, you know, everything that, that Jesse does is cool. I, I love the fact that he, you know, has been able to find, uh, you know, a way to make money doing yeah. and, and staying alive and, and, and doing stuff and still supporting the stuff that he loves. It's really great, but it's still not the same because they're not drawing national acts. And, well, they also he's shut not down. Having, he's they not shut having, down at 11 o'clock. And then, yeah, as you just said, it turns know. into a, a dance. Like, dance uh, the way it used to be in New York when you went to a concert, like I, it's funny. I was looking at an old itinerary where we played a show, and you look at the itinerary, and it's like blah 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 blah. Chromag's one a.m. Huh. So we went on at one a.m. Yeah, that we sounds really late. At 1 <laughs> that sounds late. And that was normal. Whenever you went to a concert in New York, you yeah. know, you would you would go. The doors would not open until ten, and nobody showed up until midnight. <laughs> You know, wow. the people would trip and trap it. Like everybody would show up at midnight, get their drink on, and then the band would play at one. And then the place wouldn't close. Everybody would just hang out until it ended, you know, until four. It was just like a totally different thing. It was a night scene. New York City yeah. is a night city. It's no yeah. longer a night city. Now, like, people are like, oh, yeah, we're playing at eight. I'm like, you're playing at eight. It's crazy. Well, as a as a uh, a married man with two kids, that sounds good to me. But as a yeah, as a but young, the thing is, the, the music scene is not for married men with two kids. No, no, it's not. No, it's not. You're right. It's no, for it's people who are just finding themselves and trying to find other people to play Correct. music with, and like and everybody all going to the same places and, and not even knowing how they all knew how to get there. That's the thing that always fa was fascinating to me. That I found this bar on the Lower East Side called the Park Inn Tavern on Avenue A and you know, it's like within a, within a stone's throw was Blanche's where the Beastie Boys were hanging out and across the street was A7 and yeah. you know, and, and you know, you'd see Rick Rubin and 
you know, guys from Carnivore, White Zombie, you know, Beastie Boys, uh, Jerky Boys, all these people that were not famous, all hanging out in the same room, night after night for years, before any of them were famous, with so no famous. indication that any of them were going to be famous. But the the ratio of people who got famous in that small group is unbelievable. 